I'm very glad so many of you could uh, join our evening's program with my dear friend, Rocky Ruggiero. Welcome to everyone and welcome, Rocky. Buonasera. Many of you know that my sister, Simonetta, and I founded Friends of Florence almost 25 years ago and <laughs> always interested in new programs and literature that focus on Florence and Tuscany. I suggested to my book club that we read Hisham Matar's intensely moving memoir, A Month in Siena, a slim, bewitching meditation on art, history, and the relationship between them, wrote a reviewer from The Economist. There is no one more expert, we all know, than Rocky to help us understand civic-minded Siena through its art and history. Professor, art historian, lecturer, and author, Rocky has taught and led many programs for Friends of Florence over the years. I'm so very happy you could join us this evening, Rocky. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, big buona sera to one and all, and it's always a pleasure uh, to be involved with uh, Friends of Florence and with anyone obviously interested to learn more about the beauty of Italy. And you've heard me, uh, I'm just letting people in as I'm speaking here, by the way, um, in many different ways, just celebrate the importance of protecting, conserving, um, and restoring, obviously, the great artistic patrimony uh, that is Italy in all senses. And so whether it's Florence or Siena or Rome or any of the other cities, uh, I always say my loyalty is to the art and um, for anyone, obviously, who has an earnest interest uh, in learning more and then eventually perhaps even um, uh, protecting it. Uh, Renee, I'm not sure if you know or not, and you too, Edgar and Ali, but my book came out finally. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so <laughs> this was supposed to come out in March of this year uh, because of COVID. It actually came out only about a month ago or so, so I'm very proud of that. I thought I'd share the news with you. And in fact, I read Matar's book way back in uh, late winter. And in fact, it was yeah. fantastic. And Simonetta wrote me because we posted this on Instagram as every Thursday I do a on my bookshelf theme and immediately Simonetta said, you know, great book. And I agree wholeheartedly. And so it is a great way to actually talk about Sienna, kind of tie it into what uh, Matar talks about in the book. So without further ado, let us turn to the city itself. And I think as most of you know, uh, topographically, Siena uh, is a hill town or, or more correctly, a hills town, right? It's a city that's built up on three hills. And just so you know, when visiting Italy, there is a pretty safe rule of thumb that you can follow. And that is, if an Italian city is built up on a hill, it is more than likely pre-Roman in historical origin, all right? Because the indigenous peoples that inhabited the areas uh, of Tuscany and Umbria and Liguria, what have you, would build up on hilltops for protection. Rome comes along, of course, their idea of defense is offense, and they're so busy conquering the world that they don't need to worry about doing this. And so if you visit a city like uh, Florence or Lucca or Pisa, which instead is fill, built on a flat plain, then you know it's more likely Roman in origin, right? So hill town means pre-Roman, and flat plain city instead means Roman city. Uh, Siena, in fact, was founded by the Etruscans uh, long before the Romans actually came along. And you can see, of course, how the medieval character of the city is the one that most sort of prevails uh, when you approach the city today. You can see here the tower of the Palazzo Publico or their city hall on the sort of center left of your screen. And then of course the great cathedral perched at the highest point of the entire city. Uh, and in fact, when you visit Siena, it doesn't take an urbanist or an architectural historian, I think, to realize that the entire city is pretty much organized around two urban poles, uh, one of which is religious, and that's the cathedral complex to the right-hand side of the photograph, and the other, of course, is civic, and that is the Palazzo Publico and its anterior Piazza del Campo. Uh, you could also get a sense of the really characteristic medieval urbanism of the city, where the streets you know, have a tendency to sort of meander, you know, sort of flow almost of their own will. And in fact, there are a couple of quotes from the books, if you'll, uh, from the book, excuse me, if you'll indulge me, uh, where Matar kind of just nails it. And in fact, the very beginning, uh, when he talks about he and his wife first arriving uh, in Siena and they spent the morning walking aimlessly, his description was the twisting lanes meandered with their own secret purpose 
govern less by a town planner's master plan than a spontaneous temperament, right? Uh, and in fact, it's a really uh, accurate kind of description of the way the streets seem to make their way through the city. But there's also a practical edge to all of this. Uh, consider that in the Middle Ages, when cities were in fact walled, these streets were intentionally organized such so that if an army were to breach the walls, once it got into the city proper, it would by force need to kind of dilute. It would need to spread itself out to simply get down these streets, at which point they were easy prey to the inhabitants of the city who could cast down projectiles and things like that from up above. So it's not as arbitrary as it might seem is essentially the point. Now, the other interesting thing about the book is that usually when I'm lecturing on Siena, I'll always address the cathedral complex first uh, because I am obsessive about chronology and the cathedral is older than City Hall, but Matar goes straight to the Piazza del Campo and to the Palazzo Publico. And so what I thought I would do is actually follow that uh, particular order. And so here we are. Uh, in what I believe to be the most beautiful piazza in all of Italy. Right? And that, of course, is the uh, Piazza del Campo. The building that you see that just dominates the square is the Palazzo Publico. It has been the seat of communal power in Siena for the last seven centuries. In other words, it was built as City Hall beginning in 1297, and it still serves as City Hall today, which is a pretty astonishing feat. And consider that when they began the construction of the Palazzo Publico, the uh, Council of the Nine, which was the executive branch of government in Siena, began to uh, pass zoning laws uh, concerning the other buildings in this uh, public space, that all the other buildings built in the Campo would need to be constructed of the same building material, which is brick. And anyone who's been to Siena knows that brick is, of course, the main building material for the entire city. And any other of the other buildings in the piazza would have to incorporate the same window type as City Hall. And if you look at these windows, we call them trifors or triforate windows, either noun trifor or adjective triforate. Essentially a single window opening or aperture divided into three spaces by the two columns. Um, now, if you're wondering why should I care about triforate windows, well, because when you visit Florence, you discover that our civic buildings incorporate by four eight windows. So there are architectural details that are geographically specific uh, to wherever you find yourself. So they want uniformity of material and they want uniformity of design. And you're looking at the piazza today. So well, I don't really see that. Well, you do in this one corner where essentially it has remained as it looked some seven centuries ago. What happened to the other buildings? Time. Uh, and just this general tendency, of course, to modify and to change the look of space. You can imagine seeing this piazza where technically everything looked the same. And really the only thing that would distinguish City Hall from the surrounding buildings is the great tower that you see, All right? Using, of course, this uh, vertical um, emphasis to draw people's attention to this uh, particular structure. Right? Now, the piazza itself, um, you know, and this is what the Piazza del Campo looks like under normal non-pandemic uh, circumstances. You see all the cafes with their tables opening up uh, onto the square. Um, and you can actually see how the urban space kind of ties into the very organization of uh, government. Because if you count up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of these uh, triangular segments that you see reflecting the power of the council of the nine. Uh, sort of radiating uh, throughout the entire space. Um, you know, and in fact, the way that Matar actually kind of describes it, there's a really um, extraordinary description that he has. He says, the campo also appeared like a lit up stage to be suspended. To cross it is to take part in a centuries old choreography, one meant to remind all solitary beings that it was neither good nor possible to exist entirely alone. Now, I'm not sure whether he was consci conscientious of the fact that he's hitting on one of the major themes of uh, medieval city-states like Florence and Siena, where they had this notion of the comune, right, of the community, that essentially, you know, yeah, there was the individual, but the individual was a part of a larger entity that actually was the state in the city itself. And because this is the political nexus and center 
of Siena. The idea that this really was the space that was sort of meant to represent, to draw people to congregate. Uh, in fact, whenever I walk into uh, Piazza del Campo, immediately the uh, archetype that is evoked in my mind is the Greek theater. Right? The original Greek theater carved into a side of a hill, technically, and you know there is that distinct slope of the space, and then the palazzo itself serving as what we call the proscenum, that permanent backdrop against which um, Sienes, uh city life actually takes place. And to add one more dimension to the sense of order and control and logic in this space. So uniformity of material, everything made of brick, everything incorporating the same window type. And if you look carefully, you can see the shadow here of the tower falling over the square. Consider that the radius of the Piazza del Campo is almost equal to the height of that tower. So it's almost a one-to-one -one proportion. And so the plan related to the elevation. Now, obviously, this kind of urban planning excites me. You might get that feeling. I'm a Brunelleschian. So for me, order, proportion, ratio, and what have you is really uh, the, 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 what you're striving for uh, in design. And you get it uh, so extraordinarily well inside of the Piazza del Campo. Because essentially, what the government's trying to do is to show and demonstrate to the city that they can control the city. So the more ordered the public space looks, the more effective they actually look as a government, right? Now consider, of course, that this is what the piazza looks like under normal circumstances. This is what the piazza looks like during polio time. Um, it, you know, and, and in, it's interesting in the book too, how that kind of the polio comes into it when he was talking to his friend, um, Adam, I believe, right? Who was sort of there and really wasn't fully immersed in seeing his culture until his son was born. And then representatives from the Contrada, from the neighborhood kind of showed up and said, look, we want to baptize your kid. <laughs> like, well, uh, you know, we're Muslim. We don't do that. It's like, oh, no, it's not a religious ceremony. It's a civic ceremony. Uh, it's not even a civic. It's a social ceremony, I guess would be the better way uh, to actually put it. And it's, you know, an incredibly difficult thing to effectively explain to someone not Sienese um, or in law with a woman married to a Sienese man, uh, you know, what the meaning of the palio and of the contrada uh, actually is to the Sienese. It is the, the meaning of life for them. And I try to explain that technically winning the palio, winning the horse race that takes place in the square is the single greatest objective in the life of any Sienese person, all right? That's the cherry, that's the climax, that's the apex of it all. But then it's also the whole ceremony and the ritual and the tradition uh, that goes into it. Now consider that the polio was canceled, um, both polios, which take place on July 2nd and um, August 16th were canceled this year uh, for the first time since World War II, to give you an idea of the you know, gravity um, of an excuse uh, by which they can actually cancel. And the reason obviously is pretty evident, you know, when they're cramming 30,000 people uh, into this space. And essentially, this gray flagstoned perimeter of the piazza is covered with clay so that the horses can then race clockwise three times around uh, the actual square. And it's amazing. It's amazing to see the piazza transformed from one thing into another, you know, from civic arena into horse arena. Uh, but what's also, I think, equally impressive is the whole process of it happening. You know, and I go to Siena a lot over the summer, and I'll show up, they're just starting to bring the stands in, then they got the dirt there. And then gradually you watch the whole thing transform itself. And then the amazing thing is that they actually take it all down after the July 2nd. Um, you'd imagine that they would just leave it up because the next polio race is so close, but instead they take it all down and then start the whole ritual and process again, uh, just days before the um, August 16th polio takes place. Um, bareback horses racing around the square. Each of the uh, horses and jockeys representing one of the 17 neighborhoods known as Contrada, C-O-N-T-R-A-D-A. Uh, uh, most of the Contrada or neighborhoods having uh, animal symbols, right? So Simonetta, of course, is the eagle. There is the snail, paradoxically. Uh, there is the um, caterpillar. There's the giraffe. There's the um, lupa, the wolf. There's the owl, et cetera, et cetera. And just to give you an idea of the origins of all this, when Siena was its own independent city state and had its own army, essentially its neighborhoods were organized into what would essentially be military garrisons. 
Right? And much like in ancient Rome, where the different legions had different animal symbols, there was the wolf, the bear, um, the eagle, et cetera, et cetera. That's how the Sienese organized themselves. And so they knew that their men would come from these particular neighborhoods and would be represented by symbols. Um, but then in 1555, when essentially the city was emasculated because uh, Grand Duke Cosimo I de' Medici conquered Siena, and now technically there was no external fighting, you know, the Sienese kind of turned inward. And now the competition is amongst themselves, neighborhood fighting against neighborhood uh, on many different levels. And there's that qu great quote where Matar says that the head of his language school is trying to explain to him the essence of the polio. And he says, the polio is not a sport. It's a war uh, between the different uh, neighborhoods. And, you know, the more I study it, and again, I'm not Sienese. I've seen these friends and I've been, you know, I've heard and read everything there is to read about it. Uh, there's always something else that you learn about the particular race. Uh, and of course, to see Sienna dressed at polio time with the flags everywhere, and, uh, it's just an extraordinary thing. Only 10 horses race at one time because that's really the maximum number of horses that the piazza itself uh, can accommodate. And I thought I'd give you a taste uh, tonight of the intensity and the excitement of the polio. This is actually a recording that we made last July 2019 uh, when we were watching the polio and you're not going to be able to hear me because the screaming so loud um, but just so you know it ends with an upset everyone thought that snail was going to win uh, they had the best horse they had a really good rider they hadn't won in years and so supposedly there was this kind of general agreement they were going to win and then giraffe won yeah. by a half a nose right and the comment that I make all the time is that it was, you know, a photo finish, but they're not really using photos. They're still doing it. It's ocular testimony. They have different guys watching it and everything else. And at the end of the race, you're not going to see this because they're all screaming and yelling and what have you. But as everyone was waiting to find out who won, you know, there are 30,000 some odd people in the piazza. And you have to wait until they put the flag out on City Hall. That's how you know officially who won the race. You could hear a pin drop in Piazza del Campo. I mean, the degree of concentration and of silence as everyone was waiting to find out what the verdict was, it was just one of the most extraordinary things. So everyone, just short, you know, the polio last minute, 20 seconds. Let's see if I can get it going. Um, you might want to turn your volume down. I think it might be a little bit loud, but here is July 2nd, 2019 with Giraffe as the <laughs> yelling I won actually won our pool uh, I'll tell you one, <laughs> one quick story so there were there were 10 of us and we put all the the scarves of the respective quadrados that were racing in a bag and then everyone just drew it was sortition so you were assigned we put in 20 euro a piece and winner took all technically so my wife drew for us and she took out um, giraffe but she didn't like the colors so there was another woman the woman yelling I won I won who had uh, Chivetta, who had Owl. And so they switched flags and Owl lost and Giraffe won. <laughs> so she won the pot of money. So she's very quite self-satisfactory there as well. Um, again, it, it's, it's beyond description. You can talk about it till you blew in the face. Um, but consider this, that we were sitting in an area occupied mainly by members of Snail. And again, they were the favorites to win. 
And not only did they lose, but they lost again by half a nose. Uh, and there were people around just fainting from despair, oh, yeah. losing consciousness. It was just this incredibly moving thing to see. They were in tears. Uh, it was just, it, it's such an emotional thing uh, to experience. And it's so much a part of what life is in Siena. This is not a tourist spectacle, everyone. This is something the Sienes uh, veritably live and die for as well, right? But let us move on. I don't want this to be into a lecture on uh, the Palio, which is a very easy thing to do. Let's look at the palace itself. So the structure was designed to reflect essentially the tripartite uh, organization of government in medieval Siena. So that you have the tallest central section and then two shorter flanking. Each section referred to as a torrione, right? Torre is the Italian word for tower. One is a majorative suffix. And so these are big towers, not because they're particularly tall, but because they're large in area. And each one representing a distinctive branch of government. The tallest central torrione representing the Gran Consiglio, the Great Council. Uh, so this is parliament, technically, the legislative branch. Uh, to the east of it, the shorter tower representing the judicial branch of government, the Torione del Podesta. And then the western wing that you see here uh, is the Torione dei Nove, or the Tower of the Nine. And it was the seat of the executive branch of Sienese government. Uh, and in fact, this is where we will go into now. Uh, and Matar spends quite a bit of time. And in fact, he revisits this room on several occasions, and rightfully so, uh, because what you're looking at here is the Room of the Nine, the Sala dei Nove, which I like to describe as medieval Siena's uh, oval office. Right? This is where all of the major decisions were made. And the fresco cycle on the walls is the celebrated allegory of good and bad government, painted by the great Ambrogio Lorenzetti. Um, and it's extraordinary how relevant all of this is still today. And you know, I just recently gave this lecture several times before our um, recent election. And the comment that I make, and people are always like, oh, you're going to get political. And the answer that I give is, I don't, I don't get political because I don't have to get political. These are objective standards by which to actually measure a government. And so the way it breaks down is the allegory of good government on the shorter wall, the effects of good government on the larger wall, and then opposite this wall, you have the allegory and the consequences of bad government. All right? Now, Matar does make the mistake of attributing the design of the program to Ambrogio Lorenzetti, which is not true. His job was to visualize it, but in the, the documentation that we have, there is reference to Savi, to learned men, to scholars, right, who actually help him draw up the entire thing. And I think it's, it's worth uh, a minute of our time to actually linger upon these and to discuss what these particular principles are. And so the entire allegory starts up here in the left-hand corner of the scene, where essentially the uh, idea of good government, the whole concept, begins with this winged figure in gold, who is identified as sapentia, or wisdom. Good government begins with wisdom who holds the rope supporting the scales, the plates of which are kept even by this female figure in red who is justitia, justice. And justice keeps the plates even. And on each plate, two respective forms of justice. Uh, the winged figure in red who is beheading one man and crowning another is distributive justice. And so the idea of the distribution of reward and punishment, which is what you see there. Whereas the winged figure in white on the other plate represents commutative justice. And this is the idea essentially of community, not socialism per se, but the notion of course that we do live in a community, therefore there should be a just sense of sharing. The two ropes that come off the plates into the hands of this uh, hand, <clears throat> of this figure in gray, who is identified as Concordia, all right? Concordia is agreement, accordance. And there's kind of a visual pun here uh, because the word concordia is kind of a play concorda or with rope. And the object that she holds on her lap is a carpenter's plane with which we smooth over wood, right? So if we're in disagreement, concordia smooths things out. It's an interesting play on words. And she hands that rope over to this procession of 20 for men who represent Siena's ancestral form of communal government. 
before the nine, before the great council, there was an assembly of 24 men. And so you see them here proceeding up and the rope is then attached to the base of a scepter held by this male figure in the center who's dressed half white, half black, a shield upon which appears the Virgin Mary and Christ child and the letters around his head, CSCV. Because the acronym in Siena, which is kind of a play on the Roman acronym SPQR, in Siena it's CSCV, Communis Senis Civitas Virginis, the commune of Siena, the city of the Virgin. And so the central figure personifies Siena. He is the collective, nor can you be alone, Matar said, right? Because the idea is we are all part of this comune. And the comune, that is the government, is governed by the three supreme or theological virtues of faith, charity, and hope. Right? And that's an important thing, that government should be virtuous, right? Governed by these ideas of virtues. So these are the heavenly virtues, but then the three and three figures to the left and right kind of represent the commune's earthly cabinet. You know, those virtues that most direct, af directly affect the decisions that are made. And I'll show you the first one over here on the far left-hand side. Okay, who is the Betty Boob bombshell here reclining on the pillow with this transparent gossamer? Now, folks, take it from me. A painting from 1340 with see-through drapery would have gotten the censors in an uproar. And you would never really have seen it appear in any other context because any other context would have been religious, right? I mean, it's easy to overlook the fact that what we're looking at here in this painting cycle is the first purely civic painting cycle in a purely civic context. Not just the Virgin Mary and Christ child in a church anymore. We have a whole new venue for art and Ambrogio is filling it. Well, she's identified by the three letters P-A-X, Pax. She is the virtue of peace the olive branch in her left hand, the olive branch crown, and then this kind of ambiguous <clears throat> symbol. She's resting on the cushion under which is armor, and her feet rest upon a shield. So is it that she's suppressing war, or is it that sometimes to maintain peace, we need war? And so the armor is actually at the ready. And why the seductive appearance? Well, I think ultimately, don't we all desire peace? Uh, don't we all want peace, right? And so this is sort of a play, I think, on the almost visceral desire uh, for this particular virtue. Right. Next to peace, another virtue who sits on the council of good government is fortitudo, fortitude, strength. Next to her, the female figure identified as prudencia. And prudencia holds a scroll upon which the words past, present, and future are written. Because if you are prudent, you study the past, to make informed decisions in the present to positively affect the future. Uh, there's an Italian statesman, I can't remember his name. He said, the, uh, the, the politician thinks about the next election, the statesman thinks about the next generation of people. And that's essentially what it means to be prudent when serving in government. We have magnanimitas, uh, which translates into English as magnanimity, right? It means magna anima, greatness of the soul, uh, but in this context, sort of fiscal economic uh, generosity. She holds a uh, sort of cookie sheet on her lap inside of which were once gold coins. The state shares its wealth with its citizens. Next to her, we have temperance, right? The idea in, in the Italian word tempo, that's why she's holding an hourglass. You take your time. You're not hasty. You're not impetuous with decisions because those could obviously meet, meet with an ill fate. And then next to temperance, appearing again with a sword and a disembodied head on her lap is the figure of justice, right? So think about this. In the formula for good government, we've seen justice appear four times. It's obviously the key ingredient. Now, if you take all this, you mix it well, you put it in the oven for, 300, for 30 to 35 minutes at about 475 uh, uh, Fahrenheit, this is in fact the result. And so these are the consequences or the effects of good government. Um, it is a startlingly accurate representation of urban life in 14th century Italy, all right? Uh, although it is slightly misleading. And the reason it's slightly misleading is because of the presence of the bell tower up here and the dome. So anyone seeing this would of course presume that this painting is supposed to represent Siena, 
right? Because all you need to do is look at the cathedral and it looks just like Janet. When in reality, that bell tower and that dome were painted in, in the 17th century. They're not original. This is supposed to represent a utopia, right? Utopia from the Greek, a no place. This is a Shangri-La. This is what the government is striving for. This is what they're looking to achieve. And so when you have good government, you have the, um, well, actually, let's start right here, <laughs> the figures that you see. You have dancing girls in the middle of the street. What more can one ask for than dancing girls running through the street? Now, there's quite a bit of controversy as to exactly what these uh, figures represent. I'm not going to get into this with you, but to give you an idea of just how weird people like me can be, one of the last studies of these 10 dancing figures examines the taxonomy of the insects that appear on their dresses, hoping that that might reveal exactly what they represent. In all probability, I'm of the philosophy that the most simple explanation is usually the most accurate. I'm of the belief that these 10 figures actually tie into what's happening over here. And this is a young woman in a bridal procession, because when there's good government, young women get married early, right? And presumably these are the sort of merrymakers. Today you hire a DJ or a band. Back then you'd hire young men, because they're probably men who bang tambourines and get the party started, as the expression goes. The figures here under the arch are notaries. So when you have good government, you have legal transparency, right? No under that table sort of stuff. Right? And when you have good government, we also have a booming economy. Uh, you look right here under the arch, we have the cobbler, and you see that he has customers, right? So economic prosperity is in fact a symptom or consequence of good government. Uh, next to him, my favorite part, but unfortunately I don't have a detail, is the figure here up at his lectern, and all of these students looking up eagerly, uh, hungrily at him, in fact. And this is an amazing thing for me that 700 years ago, education would be included in a very prominent place as an aspect of the effects of good government. I mean, most people couldn't read at this time, yet they're emphasizing this notion of uh, education nonetheless. And then above the figures up here suspended up top on the scaffold, when you have good government, you have construction the city grows. It's this idea of general prosperity. And I know many of you have been to Italy and seen these buildings with all these holes on the outside. You say, what are those holes? Well, now you know. Those are the holes into which wooden beams are inserted and upon which the scaffolding is actually supported as they go higher and higher, building with their mortar boards and their bricks. It just couldn't be any more of an accurate sort of uh, representation of uh, medieval life at the time. And those positive effects then spill out right, into the contado, that is into the surrounding countryside. And what you're looking at is one of the first landscape paintings in the post-ancient world. In other words, it's been about a thousand years at this point since we've seen landscape. And the reason is because almost all the art that we've seen has been, again, religious with the gold background. But now there's a secular market. And you can see how accurate a representation it actually is of the topography of the area that surrounds Siena, people moving freely in and out of the city gate, the general fertility and prosperity that we see in the um, harvesters uh, down below. And of course, the figure who hovers over it all is the figure of securitas, security. And the winged figure of security who holds a gallows in her hand, because if you threaten security, then you are justly punished by being killed. It's a direct message, but an effective one nonetheless. Right? And so, you know, one of the things that uh, Matar says when he talks about this particular allegory, uh, that first of all, this is what he had come to see. And he defines the entire fresco cycle as a demonstration with two meanings. It both praises and it denounces. And in fact, the denunciation portion of it is on the other wall. Uh, you know, we so emphatic today about positive reinforcement. Uh, sometimes negative reinforcement works as well. And perhaps the most celebrated example is Ambrogio's allegory on the right and effects of bad government on the left. Let's look at the allegory first. And everything about this is antithetical what we saw on the other wall. So if there was the sense of community uh, with that male figure and a scepter, now instead we have tyrannides. Tyranny has replaced the sense of the collective. Uh, and when you look up close, and the detail, I just find it absolutely entertaining. 
uh, with this very particular hairdo. It seems like he's very conscious about his hair. Uh, the horns that you have there, the fangs uh, popping out and the sort of cross-eyed look of the character. So they render him, you know, sophomoric and foolish uh, in appearance. He holds a hemlock flower in his right hand, a chalice in his left. So this is the poison of tyranny. And what was the she-wolf in the uh, good government has become the goat in bad government. The goat is traditionally associated with Satan and evil. And now his cabinet, right, beginning with the uh, supreme vices, which again are antithetical to what we saw before, avarice, and then the one directly above is the greatest sin of all. It is superbia, it is pride, and then the other is vana gloria, right, or vainglory, vanity. And I used to use the uh, description that she's looking in a little Revlon mirror and she just can't take her eyes off herself. And then one of my undergraduates brought me into the 21st century when she said, no, she's actually taking a selfie. And I said, oh yeah, you're right. She's taking a selfie. So this vanitous figure. And then the earthly cabinet, right? And I think this is really where it gets <clears throat> poignant. We begin with the vice on the far left-hand side. She's identified as crudelitas. And crudelitas is, of course, cruelty, represented by a woman with a serpent in her left hand torturing a child held in her right hand. And that's pretty cruel. Next to her, proditio, which translates as treason. And the traitor is represented as a regular man, but this hybrid animal that he holds with the head of a sheep and the tail of a scorpion, because the traitor seems innocuous until it stings, and then it's deadly. The figure next to him, fraus, or fraud. And fraud from a distance appears to be a rather attractive woman, but when you get up close, uh, the woman becomes a man. There's actually a blonde beard there, these bat wings coming from uh, its back, and these sharp talons sticking out below the rope. To the other side, furor. So this is the opposite of uh, temperance and the idea that you're furious, right? And the animal that he shows here that's sort of half wild boar and half um, horse. I imagine this is kind of a mistake. I think he was trying to show a centaur and the idea that when we're furious, we kind of lose our human reason and become bestial and savage, technically speaking. And again, the most poignant, I think, vice of all is this one. Okay? The D has fallen off the wall, but the word was divisio or division. And the figure is represented as a female dressed in a white and black robe, but divided vertically this time the word see on one side, the word no on the other, and she holds a saw with which she's sawing herself in half. You've heard it before, a country divided against itself cannot stand. Division sits on the council of bad government. And next to her, guerra, war. You see the letters going clockwise, G-U-E-R-R-A, war sits on the council of bad government. And then down below, remember how important a role justice played earlier? Well, look what's happened to justice. She's been straitjacketed. So suppression, one might even say obstruction, of justice is symptomatic technically of bad government. Now, what are the consequences or the results of this? Well, all you need to do now is to get out and into the effects that you see here. A wall that has been quite damaged over time because this used to be an external wall. Uh, and perhaps the most famous and disturbing scene is the one you see right here above the door, uh, where we have this woman who's being rather aggressively handled by these men. Uh, at first, some suggested a rape in broad daylight. Uh, then someone else said, no, she's wearing red, so she's a prostitute and she's being arrested. Um, whatever the case might be, uh, there is a dead person lying on the ground just below her, and that obviously can't be good. Here, we have robbery, extortion happening in broad daylight as the guy here in his pajamas grabs the other guy by the neck and the other demanding money. Uh, in the background, you know, we're in the other uh, good government, we had construction here, instead we have destruction. And you see the buildings falling apart and the people up there scared to even come out. And the only prosperous figure in a town under tyranny is the man who makes weapons. You see him back there? Because of course it is now no longer the rule of law. This is perhaps the most important part. It's no longer the rule of law, it is the rule of might that governs. And in fact, what you see is technically the only people who dare leave and go out into the contado are soldiers who are armed 
to the T, all right? Because technically it's Mad Max post-apocalyptic stuff happening out there. And the figure who governs the countryside is this winged skeletal figure who's identified as Timor, T-I-M-O-R, fear. Fear now governs. And when fear is governing, obviously we are talking about something that is symptomatic of a rotting uh, government at the time. 700 years ago, and every semester I have one of my undergraduates, you know, who writes the paper on this and uh, you know, applies it to the uh, incumbent administration or what have you. But inevitably, I think the one thing that people take away is that we should probably re reproduce this image on the walls of the offices of all the world leaders, uh, because these are <laughs> concepts that are still very much uh, relevant today in the 21st century. All right. Now, let us get out of the building. Let's go across town. And it, it, actually, one of the things that surprised me, well, it did in a day. I mean, it is a short book, but it's an intense book, is the, the not too much attention given to the uh, cathedral. He talks about it, you know, sitting in front of it, and talks about the intense white of it as well. But we're going to move across town and give it its just due. Uh, the highest point of the city reserved for the cathedral, because it is the most important thing. And consider, of course, that a cathedral is a city's way of demonstrating its devotion to the Virgin Mary, right? Nearly all cathedrals are dedicated to her. And Siena Cathedral is really one of Italy's greatest expressions of Gothic style architecture. Now, the Italians have never been big fans of the Gothic. Uh, in fact, the term itself, Gothic, was coined in Italy during the Renaissance as a derogatory way to describe Northern European art and architecture. You know, Gothic is the adjective form of Goth, and a Goth is a barbarian. So by saying Gothic art and architecture, we're saying barbaric art and architecture. And there are essentially only three uh, ecclesiastical structures in Italy that I think can compete against Chartres, Notre Dame, and uh, Rem, and Strasbourg. And they are Siena Cathedral, Milan Cathedral, and Orvieto Cathedral as well. In fact, there's a certain similarity. A very beautiful, ornate exterior to this early 13th century structure. And if you think it's decorative on the outside, well, if you've not been inside, you're in for a surprise, because how could they possibly outdo this? Well, they figure out a way. Um, you know, the, the, again, I'm a Brunelleschian, so for me, less is much, 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 much more. Uh, but in Siena, it seems, or at least inside of Siena Cathedral, more is never enough. Uh, but again, if we're looking at this as a demonstration of the city's particular relationship to the Virgin Mary, it is a very successful church. In fact, we use a Latin expression to describe this aesthetic sense of saturating every square inch of floor and ceiling um, and wall surface decoration. Uh, we refer to it as horror vacui, which translates as fear of empty space, because that is the uh, clinical condition um, um, of which the medieval scenes seem to be suffering. Now, why this particular relationship with the Virgin Mary, which, by the way, in Siena, is much, much stronger than it is probably in other, uh, any other city in Italy. And of course, the reason is because of the antagonistic relationship that Siena has with Florence. What you're looking at here on the left is the Balsana of Siena. It is the national flag of the medieval commune of Siena, half white, half black. And what you're looking at on the right is the Flor de Lis, which is the national flag of the medieval commune of Florence. Now, they're neighboring city-states, and they're constantly fighting uh, for territory. And the story goes that in the year 1260, Florence allied itself with Arezzo, put together this massive army, marched on Siena, and was about to lay siege to the city, when they rather arrogantly sent a couple of ambassadors into the city and said, look, you guys might as well surrender, uh, because there's no chance that you can withstand the assault that we're about to begin. Uh, and if you do surrender, we won't destroy your city. We'll take it, but we won't destroy it. If you uh, do not surrender, then we're going to both take and destroy it. And the story goes that the CNEs, of course, realized the reality of the situation and were just about to sign papers of unconditional surrender when a CNEs man stands up in the middle of the negotiations and stops everything. And he says, look, instead of surrendering like cowards, let us put our fate into the hands of the queen and empress of eternal life a.k.a. the Virgin Mary. Uh, his name was Bonaguida Lucari. I call him the John Adams of 13th century Siena. He rallies everyone. Okay, we're going to go now and fighting. They throw the C uh, Florentine ambassadors out, and C uh, Siena gets ready for war. Now, there's an important ceremony that takes place before they go out to certain defeat. 
there is a procession in which the keys of the city of Siena are brought to a painting of the Virgin Mary inside of Siena Cathedral. They give the keys to the painting. And this is the moment where the commune of Siena actually saw itself as being espoused, as being married to the Virgin Mary. That's why the personification of Siena was male. Usually personifications are female. Uh, allegorical figures are female. Instead, it's male because it was married to the Virgin Mary. And then they start beating the war drums, they throw open the gates, and they rush out to certain destruction. There's no way they could have defeated this overwhelming Florentine force. <clears throat> and instead, what happens that day? At the Battle of Montaperti in the year 1260 was the greatest military upset in Italian medieval uh, history. Uh, not only did the Sienese defeat the Florentine army, the victory was so one-sided that we're told that Sienese women were beating up Florentine men with cooking utensils. The Battle of Montaperti, it is the single most important historical event in the history of the city of Siena. And the amazing thing about it, and, and try this sometime, next time you're in Siena, you know, the great thing about Siena is that it's retained its traditions and its character. I mean, this is a city that voted to not have the major A1 highway pass by. They didn't want to be corrupted, you know, by having a, a highway too close to the city. You walk into a bar and you, you know, you start talking to the old timers there and you ask them, what happened that day at Montaperti? And they still get excited about it. You know, we really licked them Florentines that time. I mean, this is a battle that took place 764 years ago. And for the Sienese, it might as well have happened yesterday. When Siena, uh, the soccer team, is in the premier division and they play against Florence, if Siena is beating Florence in the match, they start chanting, remember Montaperti. In other words, we kicked your asses that time, but we're, gonna, we're doing it again right now. 764 years ago, it might as well have been earlier this morning for the Sienese. It's that vivid uh, an historical event in their sort of collective uh, conscious as well. And in fact, this is a painting that Matar lingers on uh, quite a bit, perhaps the most important um, of mobile, of easel paintings uh, in Siena, and it is Duccio's great Maesta. Right? Now, <coughs> Maesta, which is the Italian word for majesty, is an image of the Virgin Mary in majesty. This is more than just your run-of-the-mill Madonna child and saints. It is a majestic image of the Virgin Mary technically as queen. And you see the dates here. 1308 to 1311. And in fact, Matar talks about how they declared a national holiday uh, when this painting was prepared to be transported from Duccio's workshop and to be placed on the high altar of Siena Cathedral. Uh, that in fact, Duccio was allowed to sign the painting. If you look down here on the plinth, the inscription, Mater Sancta Desis Causa Senis Requi, Holy Mother of God, be thou the cause of peace for Siena. And then Sis, D-U-C-I-O, the 14th century spelling of Duccio. And because Duccio painted you of life for him, of life uh, for the artist. Uh, and consider that this painting was once the largest altarpiece ever painted in Italian art, right? And if you've been to see this in the Cathedral Museum, it's a very somber atmosphere. You walk into this room, it's kind of dimly lit, there are chairs set up and you sit down and you really get this distinct feeling like you're paying your respects at a, a wake or something like that. And in a way you are, because what you see today is just the central panel of a much larger altarpiece, a, a hypothetical reproduction of which uh, you're seeing on the screen right now. We're not sure this is exactly what it looked like, um, but this is one art historian's rendition, a painting that was once some uh, 4.99 meters, no, 4. Uh, 6.9 meters in height and 4.99 meters in width. That's about 16 by just under 16 feet. This is gigantic. Uh, and again, sitting on the high altar, when it was removed uh, and put into storage, eventually they decided that they wanted to sell this thing off. But because not too many people have living rooms large enough to accommodate 16 by 16 foot paintings, they actually dismembered it. They took it apart. Uh, and there are now pieces of the uh, Maestà spread throughout the world, right? In Washington, D.C., you actually have two pieces from the back of the Maestà. This is the central panel. And then down below, uh, you have the calling of Peter and Andrew. And I can't remember which other one you have, but you have two of them in, in, in um, D.C. The raising of Lazarus is in Fort Worth, Texas at the Kimball Art Museum. 
there's I think this one, the Jesus in the Temple, I think this is in the Frick collection. There are three pieces of it in the National Gallery in London as well. Um, and unfortunately, it was taken apart, but fortunately enough of it's left to give us an idea of just how majestic an image it was and ultimately dedicated to who else? The Virgin Mary, uh, which essentially is perhaps the most important aspect of Sienese life, right? Now consider that they build their cathedral from about 1226 and construction is more or less terminated by 1300 when they're working on the facade uh, of the church. So usually you build back to front and the facade is the last thing that goes up. When that happened, it was time for the building committee to address the issue of building a baptistry. Because if you've been to Florence, if you've been to Pisa, you know that baptistries are usually situated in an anterior position. Problem in Siena is that that brick building in front of the church is as important as the church. That's the hospital of Santa Maria della Scala. That is, you know, calling it a Motel 6 is a bit, a bit inappropriate, but it, it, you know, millions of people marching through Siena on the Via Francigena, the main pilgrimage route, and the uh, Ospedale, the, the place where you got hospitality of Santa Maria della Scala was a place where pilgrims could get food and lodging and medicinal care for free. And the building is as old as the cathedral. You can't knock it down to build a baptistry. So what the Sienese did was essentially to come up with an ingenious solution, right? And that is to build their baptistry behind and below their cathedral. So if this is up on a hill, here's the elevation up top here. What they did is they carved into the slope of the hill, created this cavity or this space, and then filled it with the baptistry. And what this allowed them to do was to actually enlarge their church. They extended the cathedral two more bays, an additional 10 meters, you know, 20 feet or so. You can see it here. This is the original backside of the church. And then when they built their baptistry, they extended over it as well. Now, why are they enlarging? Because just as they're finishing up the construction of their church in Siena, they hear that 60 kilometers up the road in Florence, that we, and I say we because I'm an adopted Florentine, we're about to begin the construction of our cathedral. And in the contract, there's a clause which reads that Florence Cathedral was going to be the largest cathedral in all of Tuscany, right? We want to supersize Pisa and we want to supersize Siena Cathedral. So the Sienese are taking preemptive measures, saying, okay, so what we're going to do is make our church, it was originally 70 meters long, now it's 80 meters long. And that's a really big church by medieval standards. And so they build the baptistry, they extend over the top, and this is the facade on the back side of the uh, uh, cathedral itself. It's kind of interesting that they have two facades, or technically one and a half, because you can see that <coughs> the um, upper portion of it was actually not done. And when this happens, they bring in a local architect to look at it and say, you know, because remember, the church is on top of it. They want to make sure that it's structurally sound. And this architect, whose name was Lorenzo Maitani, says, yeah, this is great, this is fantastic, but why limit yourselves to a mere 10 meter addition? Why not be more ambitious? Why not build something more appropriate to a city as grand as Siena? And this is in um, uh, 1326. He says, why not build a Duomo Nuovo? In other words, why not build a whole new cathedral? And of course, this guy was probably laughed at. They just spent more than a century building the cathedral. Why would you just want to start building another? So at this point, work is finished at the Cathedral of Siena. But then in Florence, shortly thereafter in 1334, the painter Giotto was hired to build our bell tower. And when people saw how large the bell tower was, they got a sense of how big the cathedral was going to be. In other words, if the bell tower is this big, then how big is the cathedral if it's going to be proportional in scale? And in Siena, they realized that technically that 10 meter addition was not sufficient to compete with the scale at which we were aiming in Florence. <coughs> so what do they do? Excuse me. This is the church that I've been referring to up to this point. That's the backside where the baptistry is underneath. This is the facade that I showed you before. In 1339 in Siena, they knock through the side of their brand new church and begin the construction of a whole new south facing nave that you see here. This is going to be the new front of the church and their brand new church, the one they just finished building, will become the transept or cross arm of a whole new south facing cathedral. All right? 
Within a nine year period, they nearly completed the construction of this Duomo Nuovo. And had they <coughs> completed it, excuse me, had they completed it, then technically they would have built what was the, what would have been the largest Christian church in the world. This would have measured 140 meters in length from front to back, all right? Um, making it by far the biggest in the world and presumably supersizing what Florence Cathedral was supposed to be. And then something called the Black Death struck Europe, not just Siena, but all of Europe at the time and brought a screeching halt to all of the work that was going on here. And in fact, Siena lost half of its population during the Black Death. You know, so people kind of, you know, not that we're exaggerating with a pandemic today, but ultimately the mortality rate uh, is, is much, much lower than it was. The Black Death was about 50%. And the city of Siena went from a population of 60,000 to 30,000 people within about 18 months. Right? And the frightening statistic about Siena is that the population today is about 60,000 people. So it's taken the city nearly you know, seven centuries to get its demographic levels back to what they were before the Black Death. And so what could have been the largest Christian church in the world essentially ends up becoming perhaps the most historic parking lot in the world today, because that's what's left of the Duomo Nuovo. Many of you have probably passed through this, perhaps without realizing <coughs> that what this is, is this sort of architectural carcass that sits in the center of the city as testimony to how you know, Siena could have been the major Tuscan city, uh, but was brought to its knees uh, by the Black Death of 1348. But ultimately, you know, that whole history uh, just adds to the character uh, of what I believe to be really one of the most extraordinary cities, not just in Italy, but in the entire world. And you know, Siena really does has this sort of magic in the air. And I think Matar did a really great job of actually trying to capture you know, what that magic is uh, in this particular city. So with that, folks, I'm going to cease and desist. And I, I would like to take questions, should any of you uh, have any. And I think- Rocky, can you hear me? I can hear you, Renee. So I just wanted to um, say about uh, Dusham Matar, uh, who is from Libya, um, the, and his father was kidnapped in Egypt and thrown into jail in Libya, never to be seen again. And so the book that precedes A Month in Siena is actually sort of a must read if you, uh, to tie in with A Month in Siena, it's the story of the search for his father. Um, he goes back to Libya um, and tries to find out what happened to his father. You know, in fact, did he die in this horrible prison? Um, under Gaddafi, and uh, he never finds the answer, and um, goes back to London, goes back to New York, and then is, you know, we read here in a month in Siena how he stands in front of these beautiful paintings uh, in London um, at the museums, and then finally has this moment where he can actually go to Siena and spend a month there, and finally live in the city and learn about the city in real time being there and then actually go and see more of the painters um, who he loved um, living uh, in London. And also I wanted to, so, so that was sort of the tie-in and I highly recommend The Return is called. Um, he won the Pulitzer Prize for it. Um, he reads it on Audible. He has this beautiful lilting uh, British accent, but you can hear the, the, the other, you know, the Algerian accent coming through. It's really a beautiful book to hear. It's very poetic. Um, but I, I also am so impressed by, you know, his, he's got this very international background that he would actually end up in Siena and so appreciating, you know, how civic minded Siena was. And because we know where he comes from, he comes from Libya, where his father was thrown into this horrible jail um, to disappear forever. And so it's this contrast, you know, the book where he finally has a moment to really meditate on it all. And the fact that he finds that himself um, in Siena, looking at these beautiful paintings of right and wrong and justice and goodness and good government and bad government and um, in a city that was civic-minded, where other, so many other 
city states were run by churches. You know, they were still, um, uh, or, or tyrants, yeah, or the uh, aristocracy, that, that he finds himself in this very democratic place. So um, I just wanted to, to make that statement. I think it's an important um, sort of in, in looking at the, the big picture and understanding his work and his, the importance of his time in Siena. In fact, Rene, when he talks about, he, I talked about three pieces of the Maestad being in the National Gallery in London, and he actually goes back to that. You know, so he's seeing yes. these paintings at the National Gallery that come from um, Siena, and in a way that was almost a sort of draw to bring him there, which is kind of extraordinary. But you're absolutely right. It's such a contrast between, you know, where he grew up and essentially the identity of this city in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Does, um, Rocky would love to answer your questions. We have them for another few minutes if anyone um, has a question for him about what he's doing. Rocky, tell us what you're doing these days. <laughs> Are you sure yeah. you have the time? <laughs> well, you're not no, in Italy. No, you're I'm not, not in Italy. Italy. So you're we've in essentially Italy. reinvented um, ourselves. So I've gone from essentially a, uh, biz a business that was about, what, 90% travel, 85% travel, uh, to about 99.9% .9 virtual. In fact, if you're okay with Renee, just to show you what I have coming up, if you're interested on Saturday, um, we actually having a live cooking class directly from Florence. Uh -huh. In the photo, that's Matteo Bollone, who's a good friend of mine, former executive chef at Le Cirque in New York, and then went to Le Cirque in Mumbai in Bangalore as well. Uh, and we're gonna be in his kitchen and he's gonna offer two, we've been doing, this is our second one actually, uh, with Matteo and they're, they're great. Uh, because well, that's we, don't, fabulous. we don't live on art alone. And then I'm doing these exclusive, every Thursday, either I'm doing something or I have my special guest coming in. So this morning, actually, someone you know, Renee, Fabrizio Nebula, who mm -hmm. is um, actually my former PhD advisor, spoke about uh, urban space in Italy. The gentleman talking next week is Quentin Hardy, he's, um, former New York Times uh, journalist, now a Google editorial, and he'll be talking about how the printing press changed everything as well. I'm doing online art history courses. I'm in the middle of a Leonardo da Vinci course um, right now. Uh, and then on January 4th, I'll be starting one on the Renaissance in Northern Italy. So um, it's, it's amazing how it's all kind of turned around. It's a lot of fun. And I told you, it really is therapeutic because it's a way for me to keep in direct contact uh, with Italy and what I was doing in Italy as well. Um, it's just a lot of screen time. <laughs> and, and tell us about your book. So the book is essentially a... Um, it's based on my, my dissertation and it's more or less a com entire building history of Santo Spirito um, dealing with all aspects essentially of its construction. So in the book format, I mean, the dissertation is a bit more you know, empirical. This I try to make a bit more reader friendly, but it really starts off with the old church and then when they get Brunelleschi and then essentially how the neighborhood, you know, goes through. It, it literally is a step-by-step -step sort of whole breakdown of what goes into building these churches um, which you know in the end we always talk about oh yeah Brunelleschi designed it and we get caught up essentially in, in the aesthetics but I think what people kind of fail to realize is that there's the day-to-day -day, um, and that it's not just Brunelleschi snapping his fingers and churches going up but you know all the bureaucracy that's involved all the factionalism that's involved families fighting with each other for um, for dominance over the, the patronage inside um, there's really, if you, there's one particular chapter, actually there are several chapters I'm very proud of, but one in particular, which is the finances and the uh, cantiere. And one of the things I do that's never been done before is to actually quantify the cost of building a Renaissance church, which has never been done. You know, people ask me, how, long, how much did it cost to build the Duomo? And we'll never figure that out because again, the expenses go over um, six generations at Florence Cathedral. But at Santo Spirito, it's concise enough, and the records that I have are detailed enough that I actually can figure out, so look, the total cost of this church based on the estimates um, break down to this. And so it's kind of an important contribution uh, to you know, economic history as well. Uh, and then, you know, some of the stuff's just, I mean, when I was writing this, Renee, like some of it amazed me as I was writing it because the, the documents that I was into are literally saying that this day, you know, whatever, December 3rd of 2020, we're raising the first column on the Western side of the nape. And for that, we're giving wine to all the workers. And then today we're lifting, you're actually, you can watch the church go up. It's very specific about where the columns are, where the walls are. 
and I have these um, computer generated reconstructions of you know three different phases of the church actually uh, being built. So it's a pretty you know again if you want to know what goes into building these things, it's a it's a good book to look at. I actually just reread it. I actually read my own book. <laughs> I thought I'd be sick of it, but I, I was detached from it enough, I think, that I could actually then step back into it. And like I said, I was pleasantly surprised by how readable it was, um, considering the amount of information that's packed in there. So. Well, congratulations on Thank your you. new book, Rocky. Appreciate it. Um, Thanks, I hope we'll see you at the National Gallery of Art again soon. So do I. When it opens <laughs> again. Yes. So do you I. Have. Absolutely. I think that was one of the last things I did. And I couldn't. Renee, do you remember when the Verrocchio show ended? Uh, yes, in February, I think. Of this year? Of this year. Okay, so I'm not hallucinating because I do, someone yeah. asked me about Verrocchio's David and I'm fairly certain that when I, when I was in Florence in January, February, that it wasn't there. And I had just seen it, right. I thought, in Washington, D.C. Right. Uh, okay. right. All right, good. So I'm not hallucinating. And that's the pandemic temporal limbo, I think, that we're all in right now. We've lost all sense of Rocky, can I ask you a quick question? Is Edgar? Sure, you can, Edgar. So, first of all, it's it's fantastic to hear you talk about uh, Italian art again. Uh, it's it brings back so many wonderful memories, uh, and you are so articulate with uh, fantastic uh, use of the language. So uh, it was I don't know where the hour went, but it just disappeared. <laughs> so thank you so much. But the question I have is. Uh, you know, that wonderful uh, painting of, uh, of good governance. Yep. Uh, how, how often do you think Sienese actually see it and do they actually um, absorb it? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I know mm -hmm. they know of it. And in fact, the, the, in, in sort of local jargon you know the, they just call it bon governo they just call it sort of good government yeah um it's it's reproduced on a lot of sort of commercial things as well you details of it most of the time um it's uh, that's a good question that's honestly Edgar, i can't answer that okay. um no i'd be presuming too much you know and, and it is you know growing up in florence i could answer by saying look i know most florentines have never stepped foot in the uffizi most Florentines have <laughs> right. never been in the cathedral. And they'll tell you that, you know, but it's like as a New Yorker, how many New Yorkers have actually been to the Statue of Liberty, you know, sort of thing. Um, right. They just see this tourist activity. But I wonder whether or not there's a difference between, you know, hitting a touristy site or knowing about the principles of the painting inside. And I guess one way I can answer it, Edgar, is by telling you that the inside of Palazzo Publico is always empty. Always empty, uh, yeah. Always. always, right. And it's amazing because you know yeah. you go to Siena. It's usually a day trip, and so you do the cathedral and the cathedral museum in the morning. Then we go to Little Loggia for lunch, and then yeah. afterwards we go to um, the Palazzo Publico. And there's nobody up there ever, and even right. local tour guides. I know almost all the guides in Siena, um, and you know they say it all the time, like they don't usually take people in there, and people don't usually want to go in there. So I'm wondering, maybe, you know, we make much more of it than they probably do at a local level. Yeah. It's possible. It's, but it is, it's such a wonderful lesson, right? It's, Absolutely. It's so pictorially, beautifully done yeah. uh, with such um, uh, imagination and creativity. Absolutely. And topical. And topical, right. I mean, it, it, never, it never ends in terms of its importance. And, and there's <clears> still <throat> research being done on it, by the way. It's not as if we've discovered everything. The, yeah. you know, there's some of the, and I, I didn't mention this, but the, the, and I know a lot of you have been there, the door that you walk through and the, once you enter the room, the door to your immediate right, those are both 15th century editions. They weren't there. The original door is the one that's walled up, the big one in the corner. Um, so we've lost portions of it. There's portions of the inscriptions uh, that have also been lost. Um, but trying to figure out, you know, pulling all all the imagery together there are these smaller paintings in it as well and you know the different laborers and the different um they call them the hours of the year and what happened I mean, there's still research being done believe it or not as much as we know about the painting there's still quite a bit that we don't know uh, which right. is extraordinary as well well that's good yeah it, it is should, good. Mis mystery should not uh, be totally revealed yeah and it's funny when you see people go in there and they look at you they're like how have i not heard about this 
You know, and that's honestly, and you know, I, I'm adamant. Like I won't go to Siena unless I'm certain that I get a chance to show whoever it is the allegory of good. It, for me, it's the most important thing in the city. Um, and then when you do pre bring people in, they look and say, you know, this is amazing. How have I not heard about this? Um, right. You know, and that's, mm. that's yeah. the great thing about the book. I mean, that's yeah. the whole, you know, think about it. The fact that he does linger on it. It's not just in passing and that, you know, again, he revisits it and sort of get a sense of, wait a second. Got the names of the books. Got the, yeah. Yeah, the books. yeah, maybe there's something more about this than meets the eye. Well, thank you anyway. This You're is welcome. great, Rocky. Absolutely fabulous.